there's an old saying that uh, truth is stranger than fiction. What we're going to be looking at in today's broadcast in the book of Revelation is two men who are 3,000 years old plus. God, thank you for the broadcast today. I pray that you might give us wisdom and insight into your word. And these things, although they may seem to be irrelevant, we pray they'd be practical in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a group of men from Silicon Valley. They call themselves the One Percenters. They are billionaires and multi-billionaires. Well, <clears throat> they have some suspicion that something nasty is going to happen to this old planet Earth. So they have gotten together and they have... Uh, uh, gone over to New Zealand, purchased a piece of property, and built an un underground bunker. You can't make these things up. What they're going to do is, the first sign of any kind of problems in the world, they're all going to hop aboard their private jets, over they go to New Zealand, and they hunker down in their bunkers for Lord knows how long, supposedly safe from whatever happens on the planet Earth. They're called the one percenters. Can you imagine? Well, what do you suppose would cause this group of men to all of a sudden decide to uh, leave town and head for New Zealand? We've discovered in the 11th chapter that something phenomenal happens. We discover that number one, well, let's put it this way, maybe a catastrophe happens. Could it be a thousand foot tsunami hits the Pacific and they've got an hour to leave town? They get to the airport quick. They've got enough time to get out of town. Or maybe, maybe a war in Israel would cause them to want to leave Silicon Valley and go to New Zealand. A war that causes the death of one-third of humanity. That would certainly straighten you out real quick. Or uh, maybe something else. The Lord knows. What we're going to look at is some events that happen in the middle of the tribulation and if these billionaires and multi-billionaires find themselves in their bunker watching TV I rather suspect if they're there long enough, they're going to see some of the things that we're going to look at tonight. We have discovered that John is given a measuring stick by God, and God says, John, I want you to go measure the temple and the people that worship there. Well, how did John know there'd be a temple 2,000 years hence? They're going to rebuild that temple right on the Temple Mount, very close to the Dome of the Omar. And as I mentioned in our last broadcast, probably 100 feet north of where the dome is now. They've determined that's where the Holy of Holies was in Solomon's temple. Well, sir, we discover as John measures the temple, it doesn't come up to par. It is a godless temple. It is a temple with a false Messiah sitting on the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, according to 2 Thessalonians second chapter he sits in the temple showing himself that he is God. And also going to see that the temple worshipers don't measure up. They are going to be quite apostate. Can you imagine an Orthodox Jew bowing down to a talking, breathing idol? An idol set up in the temple. Maybe the one percenters, when they see that, they remember the time their wife dragged him to church one time and heard the preacher say, Jesus said in the 24th chapter of Matthew, when you see the abomination that makes desolate, the idol, flee town. That would cause them to think, maybe we better get out of town. This is what's going to happen in the future. The temple will be reconstructed. The false Messiah will sit there declaring himself to be God. The people will be in ab object spiritual poverty and apostasy. It will be a sad, sad spiritual state. In view of these things, God sends two witnesses. I'm reading. Look at verse 3. 
And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Two witnesses preaching for three and a half year ministry clothed in sackcloth. They'll stick out like a sore thumb. Everybody else will be wearing three-piece suits. These guys will walk around in sackcloth. Why? Because they're mourning over the fact that God's people are bowing down to an idol. Such apostasy. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. This is verse 4. Standing before the God of the earth. Now, John says they are two olive trees because the source of light in the first century was an olive tree. They'd get olive, put it in the lamp, it would burn light for the house. So these two olive trees and two lampstands, the only light in the temple was the lampstand. The only witness, the only witness, the only light in the city of Jerusalem would be these two astounding, remarkable witnesses that God has sent to testify to his holy city. The under, other 144,000 evangelists are all over the world preaching to the Gentile nations. These men have been given a special commission to the city of Jerusalem, God's two special witnesses. And who are they? Well, I think the answer to that is found in the nature of their ministry and their great supernatural abilities. Look at this. See, there's two olive trees, two lampstands, standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut the heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophesying. Think of Elijah when Ahab was in power. Ahab, who led the people into idolatry. Elijah prayed and said, God, didn't you say someplace in the word that if the people resorted to idols, that you would stop the rain from coming down? And God says, yes, that I did, Elijah. Thank you for reminding me. I'm going to stop it from raining for three and a half years. I don't think there's any question, folks, that this is absolutely the first prophet is Elijah himself. The Lord Jesus said, Elijah is coming. The last prophecy, the last promise in the Old Testament is, I will send my prophet Elijah before the great and notable day of the Lord. And he will turn the children's hearts back to the fathers and the father's heart back to the children. There'll be a breakup of families, and of course, we're sure seeing that in this old nasty world we're living in today, don't we? Elijah will bring these families back together again. He'll be preparing the way of, of the Messiah who's going to come at the end of his prophesying. I believe the other prophet is none other than Moses himself. Why do I say that? Two reasons. Number one, because the second prophet does the same thing that Moses did. He turned the Nile River into blood. This man will be able to do exactly the same thing. Also, the Mount of Transfiguration, who was with Jesus. When he got that glimpse, the disciples got a glimpse, a little trailer, a little uh, preview of the coming kingdom. Jesus was transfigured before them. And who was with Jesus? Moses and Elijah, the two prophets. Here we are, I believe, I think we can say quite confidently, Moses and Elijah brought back from heaven, by the way, back to this earth to give a final message to the nation of Israel. Listen to this. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. This ministry goes on for three and a half years, and they are absolutely indestructible, as Elijah and Moses were also. These two prophets, Elijah and Moses, and I think it's quite significant also, considering the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel at this juncture, 
Elijah went up against Ahab and Jezebel because they led him into spiritual apostasy. Elijah is going up against the Antichrist and his false prophet because they have led the people of Israel into apostasy, the worship of an idol. Moses went on down to the land of Egypt to free the people from physical bondage, not spiritual, physical bondage, and he did so. The people of Israel are going to be in spiritual and physical bondage again, this time in their history. The Bible says the Gentiles are going to trodden underfoot the holy city for three and a half years. Why? Because the nation of Israel is under the bondage of the Gentiles again. They're back there, free now. Not going to stay that way. It's not going to stay that way. So God sends Elijah to free the people spiritually, and he sends Moses to free the people physically. Now, we know it's the Lord Jesus himself will do all these things and wrap the whole thing up, but this is a precursor to coming events. Two wonderful prophets. Can you imagine Moses and Elijah, the grace of God, that he'd send two men like this? I mean, this is the cream of the crop. Of the, you couldn't find two finer men than this. And by the way, they've been in heaven for 3,000 years. <laughs> it's all, almost like God says, you know, you guys been here for 3,000 years, and I want to tell you, you did a super job when you're on the earth. I got another little job for you. Would you mind going back to the planet Earth for three and a half years and do a little preaching, boys? <laughs> Amazing. It says, for their testimony. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to have Elijah or Moses show up in your local assembly and to preach the word of God and say, you know, I can tell you a little bit about heaven. I was there for 3,000 years. These men have got a glow about them. They've got a radiance They've got the Spirit of God on their side. They've got a peace that passes all understanding. And their enemies are attempting to murder them every day of their lives because they're preaching a message that their enemies don't want to hear. These are the exposers of the ultimate lie, the ultimate lie. Now, the world is filled with lies, but there's an ultimate lie. And the ultimate lie is that this beast this false messiah is God and is none other than Satan in the flesh. And has not that always been Satan's design? I will become like the most high God. That's what got him kicked out of heaven. And now he's sitting in the temple saying he's God and the world's bowing down to him and his idol and his false prophet is calling fire down from heaven to deceive the people. And the two prophets are saying, you're believing a lie. Their words and their life do not line up with the word of God. We've got the Bible and God on our side. And what do you have? A bunch of miracles that are performed by Satan to deceive. These men are ultimately killed because God allows them to be killed. The hedge is dropped three and a half years. They're indestructible. God, God drops the hedge. And the beast from the bottomless pit, this uh, demon, this powerful demon that's been bound for thousands of years, no doubt the false prophet himself, finally, finally puts these two to death. Let's read. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified, just so you know what city we're talking about. <laughs> Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. And what does God call Jerusalem? Sodom, spiritual apostasy. And Egypt, physical bondage. These men's dead bodies are lying out in the street, and they won't allow them to bury these two bodies. This is the happiest day in their life. I'm talking about the inhabitants of the world. This is the only joyful thing that ever happens to them in seven years of tribulation period. How do I know that? Then those who are from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into the graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts to one another 
because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth, tormented them with the truth. Can you see the billionaires hunkered down in New Zealand, passing out gifts and opening up the bottle of whiskey? This is an occasion to get drunk. We, we've been putting up with these guys for three and a half years. Their proverbial fly in the ointment, the party poopers, the, the, the Antichrist, the Messiah, he's done such wonderful things for the world. Oh, there's been a few people die, but he's a wonderful man. Listen to him speaking. How could they not want to worship his idol? What's the big deal? These people are troublemakers, and finally they're dead. But listen, that is such a happy event. Keep the cameras focused on them. Let's just keep the party rolling. At least three and a half to let's, let's wait till the flies come down and their bodies begin to rot and we can even get even drunker. This is a wonderful occasion for us. Listen to this. Then those from the peoples, tribes and tongues and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days. Hundred years ago, this prophecy would have been impossible to fulfill. For 2,000 years, almost, Christians have been mocked and laughed at because of this verse. What do we do with this verse? The Christians believe that the, everybody in the world, everybody in the world can see two dead bodies lying in Jerusalem. We don't even have a telegraph system going into Jerusalem. We don't even have radios yet, they said for 2,000 years. How can it be that the whole world could see them at the same time? All commonplace for us now with the advent of television, but friends, television is a Johnny come lately. The first TV set was displayed at the World's Fair in Chicago, I believe it was 1933. First TV set I saw was 1952, and I was astounded. Never seen anything like it in my life. <laughs> I'm an old guy. Most people can't relate to what I just said. TV is new, folks. And here we see a prophecy of the whole world, peoples, tribes, tongues. Everybody's tuned into their flat screen TV, watching these bodies rot in the city of Jerusalem. Fulfilled to the letter. Little surprise. The party's not quite over yet, but it's about to end. Listen to this. Now after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on all those who saw them, and they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. Wow. <laughs> Can you imagine? The rejoicing, but the, tri the triumphing of the wicked, the Bible says, is, is short. Three and a half days, God performs a miracle. You boys looking for a miracle? The Bible says Israel requires a sign. Show us a sign from heaven, Jesus. God, in his great grace, shows a magnificent sign to the world, the beleaguered world, the beleaguered Jewish people under the gun, under the Antichrist boot. After all, one-third of them are going to get saved. Zechariah, 11th chapter, one-third is going to come purified by fire. What's going to convince them? Two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, dressed in sackcloth, preaching fearlessly for three and a half years and dying with a smile on their face. You're going to just kill me, beast? I'm just going to go back to God. I've been there before, you know. I spent 3,000 years and I can't wait to get home. You can't do me any harm. And they're going to see these men die without a thought of fear, trembling. And then they're going to see a miracle that the vast majority of them thought could never happen. The vast majority, 75% seminary professors and students that graduate from theological Bible schools don't believe there's a physical resurrection. And they're going to see it happen before their very eyes. 
Little wonder fear fills their heart. Whoa. Notice what happens. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell, and they were afraid, and men were afraid, and they gave glory to the God of heaven. Wow. Huge earthquake. 7,000 people died in the earthquake, and a huge group of Jewish people turned to the Lord. Finally, finally, the preaching didn't do it. Three and a half years. This miracle convinced multitudes that the Christian message was true after all. It took a long time to get to this juncture. We're right at the very end of the tribulation period, and finally, they start coming in droves to the Lord Jesus. If God raises these men from the dead, then he raised Jesus from the dead. They're preaching all about Jesus. This is his miracle. He actually did rise from the grave 2,000 years ago. We see it before our very eyes. These are convincing miracles, to say the least. Wow, what a story. Verse 15. Then the seven angels sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell out on their faces and worshiped God. And here we see this huge event. We see it happen on the earth. We hear a voice, come up here same voice that John heard when he was caught up to the third heaven, caught up into the very presence of God. It was a rapture back then, but this is at the end of the tribulation period. This is these two witnesses. Same voice, come up here, and we see a great welcome home ceremony. <laughs> the 24 elders were not complete with Moses and Elijah gone. <laughs> Can you imagine the hugs and the, and the and the tears that were shed when Moses and Elijah got into the, back into the presence of God. Welcome home, boys. You did a great job. Three and a half years down, you did a great job. Well done, good and faithful servant. They, after all, are part of the 24 elders because the 24 elders consist of the church, 12 apostles, symbolically, and 12 tribes of Israel. They are back home. And what are they doing? As soon as they get back, Hallelujah, God's going to reign. The coming home of these two men, the fulfillment of the ministry of Elijah, the make straight the ways of the Lord, has now prepared the way for Armageddon, the last battle of the Lord Jesus with the saints, leaves the presence of, of God. He comes back to this planet and he wages this war called Armageddon and he takes back the planet for himself and for his church and for the nation of Israel. He comes back and he saves the people of Israel. Listen to this. We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. At the time of the dead, that they should be judged, when the Lord Jesus comes back, there's going to be a judgment. Who for? All the people who survived the tribulation period and all the tribulation saints. Those who have died as martyrs during the tribulation will receive their crowns at the second coming of Christ and be alongside and reign with the church who's already been rewarded at the rapture. Listen to this. The time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints. And to those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those, and listen to this final little, little nugget, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Very interesting. Little man, <clears throat> been on the run since the Garden of Eden. God, I heard you walking in the garden, and I was embarrassed because I was naked, and uh, me and Eve have made ourselves these fig leaves, and we're kind of hiding out. Um, <clears throat> anything we can do for you, Lord? Yeah, come on, I don't want to talk to you. Little man's been hiding for 6,000 years. He hides very often in religion. 
seems like a pretty good place to hide. But he's merely putting on fig leaves. He's avoiding the real issue, the garment of salvation and a righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. It's much easier to be clothed in a false religion and uh, feel comfortable in that than humble oneself, seeing your desperate need for salvation and coming to Christ and being born into God's family. Much easier to hide. Now we discover that when Jesus comes back, he flushes out like he flushed Adam out. Adam, come on out. Where are you hiding? God comes back, brother. Man, little man can run, but he can't hide. And those one percenters down in New Zealand in their bunkers, watching their television sets, seeing this resurrection, if they still don't trust the Lord Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus, when he comes back, sends forth his angels. They're like reapers. Remember the parable that Jesus told about the farmer <clears throat> that had the wheat and the tares. And uh, the farmer said, you know what? I don't want anybody going into my field and trying to separate them now. Uh, we'll, when everything gets ripe, we'll be able to tell a difference between a tear, which is a noxious weed, and uh, something that is good like a stalk of wheat. And we'll go in and reap then. And Jesus, using that analogy, said, that's the way it's going to be like at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and he'll separate the just from the unjust. And those folks hunkered down and their bunker will be dragged out by an angel and brought to judgment to stand before the Lord Jesus. And brother, nobody wants to do that. That ain't going to come out good. Pardon my poor English. Why? How can a man, unrighteous man, stand before a holy God, and be declared innocent. He can't. He has no atonement. He has no payment for sin. He has, he has rejected what Jesus did for him on the cross. Reject the only hope there is. There is no hope. And Jesus said they're going to burn with unquenchable fire, the tares. Reference to people God has to flesh out when he comes back to this planet. The evidence is overwhelming. They see it before their very eyes. They see a corrupting bodies, two of them laying there. They know they're dead, and yet they see them come back to life and stand on their feet and then are caught up into heaven. What could be more compelling than that? So, God's going to destroy those who destroy the earth. Verse 19, then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in the temple. And there was lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. Wow. Now, that's the last verse of the 11th chapter. What's this all about? Well, the two witnesses are murdered. They rise from the grave. And then God gives the nation Israel a great sign. To the Gentile, it means nothing. To the Jew, it means everything. God opens heaven, and they get a vision of their ark. It's been missing for 3,000, 3,500 3, years. It's been gone since King Solomon's temple. It's been gone. It is the heart of Judaism. Not even, it's greater. Let's put it this way. It's greater than the temple itself. The temple houses the Ark of the Covenant. Why is the Ark of the Covenant so important? It's where Old Testament saints found mercy. It was a box about four feet long, foot and a half wide. It contained the Law of Moses, the, ten, the two tablets, the Ten Commandments. It, con it contained some manna, <laughs> actual manna. And Jesus said, I'm the bread that comes down from heaven, picture of Jesus. And it contained Aaron's rod, which budded, a picture of resurrection. And then on top of that lovely ark, it was made of beautiful Acadia wood covered with gold. The Acadia wood speaking of the humanity of Jesus, beautiful. The gold speaking of his divinity. There was a chair, a chair on top of the Ark of the Covenant. 
is a picture of God sat there to judge humanity. And the Jewish people brought the blood of the little lamb in once a year. And they sprinkled that blood all over the Ark of the Covenant. And God said, if you accepted the blood, which you normally did, you're forgiven. You're forgiven on the basis of the sprinkled blood. Without the shedding of blood, Moses said, there's no remission of sin. So God, instead of being a judge to the nation Israel, was a merciful savior to them because of the blood sacrifice. They've got their temple back, but there's no Ark of the Covenant in it that they can see this legitimate. A vision of heaven is opened up. There's the Ark. It's been missing for 3,500 years. It gives hope to Israel. We are going to find mercy with God. <laughs> By the way, when Jesus comes back, there won't be an Ark of the Covenant in the temple that he resides in. See, how do you know that? Ezekiel, third chapter, 16th verse. It says there will be no more Ark. There will be no more memory of it, nor will it be rebuilt again. Why? Because the Ark speaks of Jesus. Where does the child of God find mercy today? With Jesus and Jesus alone. Him and him alone. Who do we come to to get saved? Jesus only. We said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except by me. He shed his blood 2,000 years ago to make a total, complete payment for our sin. Oh, it's so simple to come to Jesus. You don't need to fly off to New Zealand to hunker down in a bunker. You can escape the wrath of God by simply coming to the Lamb of God, coming to the Lamb of God, trusting Him to be your personal Savior and being born into God's family. You know what's going to happen? I'm going to close on this note. God's Holy Spirit's going to come to live inside of your heart and your loneliness is going to end. That's huge, folks, because without God, Something's missing. You've got to admit that. There's a loneliness. There's a boredom. There's a despair. Jesus takes it all away. He takes the loneliness away. He takes the boredom away. He gives meaning and purpose to life like nobody else or nothing else can. These two witnesses testify to that fact. They're hated with a passion. They're murdered. God raised them from the dead. And then the Lord Jesus comes back and takes possession of this planet. Are you ready for that coming, by the way? Are you ready for the rapture? Are you reconciled to God? One final verse. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer holding their trespasses against them. Thank you for joining us today, and may the Lord bless you. Until next time.